Good morning. Welcome to Hope Church. Uh, we're so glad that you joined us uh, for today's service. Um, it is uh, last week, uh, I remember, we prayed for rain, and uh, it has been a, a good week. Um, God has provided uh, rain for the fields and for the farmers, and, uh, uh, and still uh, lots of sunshine as well, being summer. And so we are happy that uh, God is looking after all our needs. He is the God of the seasons. He's the God of time. He's the God of the universe. And that is why we praise him. Uh, again, we are glad that you joined us uh, today. Uh, we are continuing our series on uh, the life of David, uh, specifically grace in the life of David. And, um, uh, and I look forward uh, to uh, reading God's word and, uh, and hearing from him a little bit later on the service. We'll be uh, singing uh, as well. Um, we'll be hearing uh, some updates um, for ministry, and uh, we will, of course, take time to pray as well. Uh, we have a few things to celebrate before uh, we uh, continue with uh, praise and worship. Uh, there's uh, 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 quite a number of birthdays uh, this week, uh, including today. Bas Van Andel is uh, celebrating his birthday today. Tomorrow, Linda Durwater. Uh, Tuesday, uh, Mackenzie Banstra. Wednesday, uh, birthday shared by Wes Mason and James Vanderwall. And then Friday, Jane Batterink and uh, Rita Beenan share a birthday. So almost a birthday on every day this week. Uh, we celebrate God uh, with you. Uh, we celebrate God because he has uh, given you yet another year of life, and we're glad uh, that you're living that uh, in our midst. Um, on Wednesday also, um, Paul and Cynthia are counting 25 years uh, of marriage, and so uh, we thank God uh, for them as well and uh, for their marriage. Um, yeah, uh, at this time, I can invite you to uh, open your hands, uh, wherever you are, uh, to receive God's blessing. And I have the privilege of uh, proclaiming that blessing. When we get together, God greets us, and so receive now God's blessing. God, the God of the universe, the God of the seasons, the God of time, he is the one that greets us this morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and the Spirit who lives in us every day. Uh, grace and peace to you from God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen.
Please join with me in congregation prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this morning, this time we're able to come together and just spend some time with you. Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you, Father, for the power of the Holy Spirit that by faith in Jesus Christ, it's that's how we know you more, Father. You have drawn us by the power of the gospel to the light of your word. And Father, we were hopeless. You've given us hope. You've given us eternal hope, Father. You have saved us through your goodness, mercy, and grace. So Father, as we gather here this morning in your house of worship, Father, we pause to reflect on your goodness and your sustaining love. And as we continue to journey along, Lord, as things are opening up and With this COVID-19, Father, there's still that worry, that fear, the distress, the times of loss, Father, that people are facing all because of COVID-19. And Father, we're able to be so grateful to come together to offer you the praise and glory you so rightly deserve. Father, we lift up to you this morning those, your people, those who are facing health concerns, Father, those who are finding it difficult in this heat Father, those who are finding it difficult to spend time to be able to go and visit with family and friends, those who are struggling, Father, just to work through the maze and the struggles of getting a doctor's appointment. Father, we pray for those this morning who are facing loneliness, 
Father, as we need to be so careful about isolating and going around with masks, Father, we lift up to you those who are just so lonely, those who are struggling with aging, those who are struggling with their, their employment, their jobs. And Father, we especially lift up to you this morning those who are struggling with their faith. As Even though we come together um, in this medium, Father, we don't come together and be together as a whole congregation in your, in your house. So, Father, we pray for those. We pray, Father, with sometimes those burdens in life that seem so great for us, and yet, Father, we know that you are a Father who loves us, and all those struggles, Father, you will see us through. Father, help us to see the needs of one another. Help us to reach out to them and offer them our comfort and love that we feel from our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we lift up to you this morning, Joanne, and we are th very thankful, Father, for the successful outcome of the surgery she had. So now, Father, we do pray for healing, and we give her, ask for patience. We ask that during this time, Father, you just draw her into a, a deeper relationship with you. Father, we continue to lift up those who are what we would call our frontline health care workers, those who are... Um, doing all sorts of jobs, Father, that put them perhaps in, in harm's way or um, in the face of perhaps getting sick. Father, we just pray that you will protect them. We ask you pray that you will keep them safe during this time. Father, we think of so many people. We think of our, our missionaries around the world, um, what this has made a difference in their lives, how this has impacted them, Father. So we just pray that you will give them all that they stand in need of, that you will allow them to be creative in the ministries that they're doing. And Father, we pray that that works its way down even to the local church, Father. Help us to continue to be creative as during these times of closure that we, O oh Lord, are able to draw people closer to you. Father, we do pray for our governments who are facing decisions daily. Father, we pray that they will do so wisely. And Father, we pray that all the decisions they make are honor and glorifying to you. Father, we continue to lift up the church and we continue to pray that you will send and raise up leaders among us, Father, who will uh, seek to do your will as we seek for nominations for pastoral elders, deacons, and church elders. Father, continue to use each one of us as a beacon of your hope to the community. Father, we do lift up to you, again, the farming community, the gardeners, and we pray, Father, for some more rain. Even though the crops are starting to look better, Father, there are those who have yet to receive rain. We pray that this heat and drought will soon come to an end. And as we journey, Father, we pray for the faithfulness that you will provide, that we become more dependent on you, Father, and less than ourselves. Father, we pray for those who are trying to adjust to what the new normal looks like, Father, with their kids throughout the summer. And, and as we hear so many rumors and ideas and discussions about what the new school year will look like, Father, when will we be able to come together? When will we be able to worship together as your people? So many questions, Father. So give us patience. Give us wisdom to make decisions that are honoring to you. Father, we do pray this morning, though, that Jesus Christ may be fully displayed in each one of us through our actions and our deeds and our words, Father. And we pray all these things. And I would invite for you to join with me as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. So we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm here with Jessica Taylor from Young Life, and um, this month's focus for Hope Church is about Young Life. And rather than myself or one of the deacons talking about it, I thought we'd bring Jessica in and ask her some questions about what's happening with Young Life. So, Jessica, you've been married now six months. A lot of changes in your life in the last six months. COVID hits. How are you and Bradley doing? 
Yeah, so definitely um, not what you would expect when you get married. Um, our first six months being in a pandemic. I think we only had two two good months before that hit. So um, yeah, so it was an adjustment for us for sure. Um, one thing we're really thankful for is that we both were able to keep our jobs during this time. Um, even though our hours kind of look different, um, we had to readjust to that. Um, and then the second thing is that we actually got this unique opportunity to have even more quality time um, during those first few months than maybe we would have been able to otherwise. And so we're very thankful to be able to have that at our, the beginning of our marriage. Great. So bad, uh, Bradley can still go to work and blow up batteries. Yes, still Good doing that. Exciting. <laughs> So Young Life is more than just one person, and there's several leaders, and I believe there's 12 or 14 leaders in North Durham. Mm -hmm. um, what's their work like with Young Life now through COVID? Yeah, so definitely um, we were kind of, uh, well, everybody was expecting to go on March break and then have two weeks of no school, right? And so originally we were told we weren't allowed to do Young Life in person if the schools weren't in. So that was kind of what we were going off of. Um, and then the schools never went back. <laughs> and so um, I was really fortunate to be able to work with a group of really creative and awesome leaders who they didn't skip a beat. Um, we jumped right into Zoom Club. Um, and so we had the March break where we wouldn't normally do club. And then the first week back, we were right into Zoom Club. Um, and so it was a bit of a struggle, like trying to find things to make Zoom fun, <laughs> especially for teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, but we got into this really cool kind of groove where um, we would play a couple games that we could play online. Uh, we would do our normal club talks, so we still got to share about our faith. Um, and then we would break into breakout groups um, with like a, a group of kids and a leader. Um, and we got to talk more about um what we had learned in the club talk we got to talk about how we were doing emotionally <laughs> during this time and, mm -hmm. and um all of the changes um and we got to talk about like how we related to what was said in the club talk um and so this opened up the door for some really really great conversations with kids um and it took a, a little while for them to get used to that um but after a while they started um opening up more than they ever had before I don't know if it was because they were in the safety of their own homes mm -hmm. um, or if they just got used to like um, constantly being asked all the same questions, but um, they ended up opening up and we got to have some great conversations with kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so now that it's the summer, uh, we've closed off the official clubs um, mm -hmm. for the summer, except for the one in Port Perry, because they requested that we still do club during the summer because... Cool they're going through some things and so they um, had just asked for that. And so we're doing every other week in Port Perry. Um, we just play a bunch of games and still get to chat and stuff like that. Um, but other than that, we're doing a lot of hangouts in person now, obviously yeah. following the guidelines. And so um, this summer leaders are really dedicated into um, just like, bringing back that more relational in-person side of things that we're known for. And so um, we've been doing some badminton competitions, social distancing. Um, we've gone into geocaching. Okay. Um, we go hiking with kids uh, and just stuff like that. So obviously we have a lot more limitations, but it also forces us to be more creative in um, things that we can do that are still safe and that follow all of the guidelines. Sounds interesting. So there's still contact work happening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> lots of people meeting up. So mm -hmm. so one of the highlights of Young Life is Saranac, and, and their tagline is, uh, you'll have the greatest week of your life. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds pretty difficult to replace, and I'm, I'm sure it can't be replaced. But what are we doing with Young Life, with the, with the youth, to try to compensate for that? Or how are we trying to create that impact that Saranac would? Yeah, so this, this year we're really focusing with our staff and with our leader team um, just on the idea that like camp is just a place. It's just a property um, and we can actually bring those aspects um, of relationship and the things that the kids love about camp back home. And so we won't get to do parasailing, obviously. We won't get to do 
the giant swing or things like that. Um, but we're really working hard to bring some of those camp elements into our own backyards. And so um, over, we'll have one week for high school and one week for wildlife. Um, and we're just going to have concentrated time that leaders are investing in kids. And so the kids will know that every day during that um, four days, there will be a leader planning something. Um, and so we have a bit of a budget given to us by like our regional office um, to make those ordinary things just a little bit more fun. Um, and so maybe if I plan a day hike with a bunch of girls, um, there'll be ice cream waiting for us at the end or something like that. Um, or maybe some mini golfing and, and things like that. And so we're working hard to be able to make ordinary everyday things just a little bit uh, more awesome. Uh, and then uh, we're still focusing on obviously like one of the biggest things about Saranac and the other camps is that we get to share our, our faith with teenagers in a more like concentrated um, like time. And so um, we have eight staff people in Ontario that are working right now to um, be able to film short like Devo style videos that at the end of our hangouts, um, they'll, we'll be able to show those to the kids and then we're still gonna have cabin time. Um, and believe it or not, cabin time is usually the favorite part of um, teenagers when they go to camp because it's just time um, usually at night where they just get to process everything and open up about things that they've never talked about before. Um, and so we're still doing that. We're still going to be able to have um, a gospel presentation. We're still going to be able to process that um, with our kids in, in smaller groups. So. Hmm. Good. That sounds exciting. Yeah. And as well as a lot of work and a lot of new things for the leaders to wrap their head around and make happen. So Young Life is a, uh, a locally sponsored organization, which means we raise our own money in North Durham. Mm -hmm. um, how are the finances at Young Life and what are we doing to replace the gala that we normally have in the spring that we didn't have? Yeah, so obviously like COVID, um, one of the biggest impacts it's had on Young Life is our finances. Um, and that's pretty uh, similar across the board. Um, because we do really rely on that fundraiser uh, to bring in kind of the rest of our budget. And so um, we are looking at a financial gap by the end of our fiscal year um, that is about the amount that the fundraiser would have brought in. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we're kind of hoping to make up for um, over the next few months. And what is that fiscal gap? Yeah, so we're about $20,000, which normally our fundraiser, the gala brings in, um, in between fifteen to 20000 So Okay, so we're having a walk-a-thon, yeah. a bike-a-thon type event, and hoping to raise some of that money. Yeah, so Ontario um, as a whole, we're doing um, what we call the Fondo, which is basically a day that we set aside um, to have both a walk-a-thon and a bike-a-thon like Henry said. And so um, what happens is we sign up um, to be on North Durham team and the money that we raise in sponsors goes back to the area. And so we have eight people signed up on um, our North Durham team right now, and mm -hmm. we're hoping to get a few more. Um, and we're going to all be um, collecting pledges and sponsorships um, to do this walk in September. Great. So that's a great way for the church, for the members to get involved. That's a, mm -hmm. you may sign up to walk, you may sponsor somebody. I know myself and Tina will be in there. Mm -hmm. um, you and Bradley will be walking as well. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some other from committee that will be there. So we're looking forward to um, asking for support in the future. Mm -hmm. And the date of that event is? September 12th. September 12th. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing some time with us and explaining to the the uh, church what Young Life is up to. And if you will allow me, I'd like to uh, close in a prayer. Perfect. Thank you. Dear God, we just give you thanks for Young Life. We thank you for Jessica and her um, ability and her excitement to lead Young Life. We just pray a blessing on her and all the leaders as they are working towards the... Um, 
the events that close out the summer, Lord, and, and particularly reaching out to the youth, um, showing them the love of Jesus, Lord, and just uh, getting to know them better and walk with them through life. We ask a blessing on the finances of Young Life as, uh, as we're collecting money this month and into the fundraiser. We just pray a blessing on that as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And thank you to Hope Church as well for everything that you guys have done um, for Young Life and just being able to be partners in our community. So thank you. Thanks. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in the front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had brought her, had her brought to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been a been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was good to hear that update about uh, the work of Young Life. Uh, thank you, Jessica, and all the other Young Life leaders for, uh, for the contact work that you continue to do during these uh, challenging times. Uh, we're all struggling to do our things um, with all the restrictions and limitations in place. And, uh, and it's hard for us to imagine um, what it must be like for you to continue uh, to do what you're doing. So uh, please remember to, uh, to pray for the Ministry of Young Life. And thank you also, Rob, for uh, reading uh, our scripture passages uh, for today's message. Uh, likewise, a challenging story uh, of David's struggle with sin. Uh, let's take a moment uh, to ask the Spirit to guide our uh, hearing of God's Word to us today. Let's pray. Spirit, we believe that it is uh, you that inspired um, people to write uh, the very thoughts, the very words of God. And so, um, as you were present to uh, to record, to write those words, we also ask that uh, you be present as we hear uh, these words now. Father, uh, speak to us uh, so that your word may live in us. In uh, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've likely heard uh, the words, for it is by grace you have been saved. It's a Bible verse, uh, Ephesians 2, verse 8, that is often quoted to teach us that our hope does not lie in our own strength, not in our own abilities, uh, not in our own abilities to live perfect lives uh, and without mistakes, but uh, that we all need the grace of God to live rightly 
and to live well. Now, a legitimate question to ask, of course, uh, and one that rarely gets asked anymore, is what we need to be saved from. Even uh, the way I express myself just now, saying that we all need the grace of God to live rightly and to live well, avoids what uh, lies underneath and at the heart of the verse. Something we rarely talk about anymore, even in church. Because it's uncomfortable. And probably because it's politically incorrect to talk about. I am talking, of course, about sin. Now, Bell's ongoing campaign, Let's Talk, encourages people to talk about mental health, a topic that is often hidden uh, and for uh, many years and perhaps many generations, it was simply not talked about. Bell's campaign uh, is trying to draw out uh, a topic that needs to be talked about. Now, I have a sense that something similar is uh, needed in regards to sin. Sin is the great unconversation, the thing that you just don't talk about. It's uncomfortable, and why make people uncomfortable, even in church? Why don't we talk instead uh, about positive things like love and grace? For it is by grace you have been saved. And we're back to where we started. Now, in order to be saved, of course, you have to be in trouble in the first place. And if we're unwilling to acknowledge the problem, uh, then we're also not ready to talk about the solution. Speaking about grace without talking about sin is a little ta like talking about surgery without being sick. But pastor, you say, uh, I thought the Bible uh, was the story of God's love. Good point. Because God's love was needed to break through the sin that was piling up in people's lives. All the way back in Genesis already, chapter 6 as a matter of fact, uh, sin piled up rapidly. Uh, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness had become. Uh, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. That's verse 5 of chapter 6 of Genesis. That's a description of sin that goes deep, doesn't it? And that's precisely the point. When we fully realize the depth of sin, it is only then that we can talk meaningfully about grace. Now, we've been talking the last three weeks about grace, grace in the life of David. It was God's grace that enabled David to slay the giant, Goliath. God had chosen David. God had shaped him as a shepherd boy. And God then empowered David with his very own spirit. And so David was able to topple the giant. It's a story we know and we love. It is told to us and to our kids in Sunday school. However, here's the thing. If we stop reading here, or if this is the only story that we end up reading about David, then we would miss the point entirely. Because it turns out that David had to face a bigger giant than Goliath. The giant of a heart turned away from God. Because a heart that is not occupied by God, uh, without God on its throne, is a heart occupied by something else. God had lifted David to great heights. It was with God that David had walked uh, as a shepherd boy. It was with God also uh, that he had defeated Goliath. 
And it was with God that he escaped the jealousies of Saul, the first king. And it was with God that David had become himself the king of all of Israel. But then, then David gave room for sin to take up space in his heart. As David enjoyed his successes and favor uh, of God in his life, it was then that a giant much bigger than Goliath struck. One preacher, reflecting on David's fall into sin, uh, remarked this. Satan, he said, knows if he uh, cannot get us with a sword, then he'll do it with a smile. And that's a pretty accurate description, I think, of the way sin crept into David's life. When we look at uh, closely, more closely rather, uh, at the way it happens, then we will notice a subtle progression of sin. It started with a look. Uh, it continued with an inquiry. It led to an invitation. And it ended with an insidious plan. First, uh, there was that look. Second uh, Samuel 11, verse 2. One evening, it says, David got up uh, from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. I'm sure you've had nights like this. Now, uh, granted, we don't all have palaces, but uh, many of us do get up in the night and we walk around um, uh, before we get back to bed. Well, this uh, is David now getting up. And from the roof, the Bible says, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman, it says, was very beautiful. Now, had David left it there, but he doesn't leave it with the look. The look turns into an inquiry. Verse 3 of chapter uh, 11 of 2 Samuel says that David then sent someone to find out about her. David stepped into the temptation rather than away from it. And that glimpse, that accidental look, uh, then turned into him asking some questions about just who this woman was. Well, this inquiry then turns into an invitation. Verse 4 says, uh, Then David, and I think it leaves out King David, uh, Then King David sent messengers to get her. Now, I emphasize that he was King David, uh, because it, this was really was more uh, than an invitation. When a king invites uh, you... Uh, it is much more akin to a command. You don't refuse a king. And the messengers that he sent with the invitation were uh, more likely uh, to be uh, soldiers. The invitation brings Bathsheba, of course, uh, to his bed. And um, he sleeps with her. And uh, Bathsheba finds that she is pregnant. That leaves uh, King David, of course, with a problem. And that then leads to that final uh, progression of sin that started with an innocent look and ends with an insidious plan. It leads uh, to uh, the horrible crime of murdering the husband of the woman that David stole away. In the morning, says verse 14, David wrote a letter to Joab, a captain in his army, and he sent it with Uriah. Imagine this. He sends a letter with a plot to murder someone with that very person. He sends a letter to an army captain with the person he intends to murder. And in it he writes this, the Bible records. Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the uh, fiercest. 
then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. It's a well-orchestrated and evil plan to rid himself of the husband that stood in the way of David's lust. A look that ends in premeditated murder. The progression of sin. Now, for most of us, uh, it doesn't uh, end in uh, such uh, a, a drastic way. But I would suggest that um, our falling into sin is uh, very much along a similar path. A look, an inquiry, an invitation, and then a plan. Well, David's actions, his sin, had consequences, of course. Uh, though a man after God's own heart, God confronts David and deals with the evil that he has done. In 2 Samuel 11, verse 27, we read, The thing David had done displeased uh, the Lord. Now, I think displeased is rather mild. It's almost like in that British, uh, uh, I am displeased. Uh, but stronger still is another uh, uh, verse uh, and it is uh, God following up by sending the prophet Nathan. And this prophet asks of David, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? And I think this is much stronger and this kind of gets at what is going on here. God is displeased. For the fact that David chooses to disobey God. God has laid down the way to live. He has laid down his commandments, and among them is do not commit adultery. <laughs> Another, of course, is do not kill. And David does both. And Nathan says, why do you despise, why do you hate the word of the Lord? Why do you do evil? Because not doing God's good will really is doing evil. And it is here, I think, that we get at the heart of David, at the heart of sin. Sin displeases God. And it despises the way prescribed by God. In effect, it dethrones God from your life. And it gives room to evil to reign in your life. Now, we don't often think of sin that way. We think of doing something wrong and, well, everybody does something wrong sometimes. But in the bigger picture... We are called to walk with God, to walk in the way of God, to do that which is right and good. Because that's what God intends for us. That's what God desires for us. Now, if God is all-powerful, you might ask, why does he allow such a coup d'etat? Well, because God is a respecter of persons. And because he respects uh, his creatures, he has given them the ability to choose. He has given them a precious gift. He says, I want you to choose uh, for me. I want you to choose uh, what is right. I don't want robots. I don't want to be the one that controls you like uh, chess pieces on a board. No, he says, I want you out of your own volition out of your own will, to, to choose to love me and to obey me and to follow me. But this gift of choice, I think, has led uh, to much trouble in the world, hasn't it? I think Christian apologist Ravi Zacharias said it best. 
He said, God gives you uh, the most sacred gift of the prerogative of choice. But, he says, uh, he doesn't give you the privilege of determining a different outcome of what that choice will entail. The consequences of your choice are bound to the choice that you make. Choosing other things over God, in other words, will have consequences. And those consequences will always be less than the good that God intends for you. Uh, that's a mouthful. And I just want to uh, repeat that. I want to make sure that we understand what I'm saying here. Choosing other things over God. Because you think you know better. Because you think you know better what is good for you. You have the freedom to do that. God gives you uh, the freedom of choice. But we must remember that the choices that we make will always have consequences. And now listen again uh, to this part because I think this uh, is so crucial and we often miss this altogether. The consequences of choosing something other than what God chooses for you will always be less than the good that God intends for you. That's deep and it's profound. It's also the reason why it is always better to obey God than to go your own way. It's why it's good to keep God on the throne of your heart. Because dethroning him will always lead to a, a lesser thing of value than what God wants for you. Now, back to David's story. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, who has confronted David now with his sin, sent by God. David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And it is here that we see once again David's heart. David was a great sinner, a human being like each of us capable of being tempted by sin, it is true. But he longed deep down to do God's will, and he was grieved when confronted with his failure. He sinned greatly, yes, but he repented greatly also. And so will all who love God and who will receive his grace. Because when we repent, when we turn back, when we call out to God in the deepest darkness of our soul, no matter what we have done, it is a sign of God's grace working already in your life. We think often that we have to beg God for his grace. But even the fact uh, that you are brought to your knees, that you, are put, uh, that you put yourself in this posture of turning to God and crying out to him, uh, you've already shown signs of receiving his grace. Romans 2 verse 4 tells us that it is God's kindness that leads you towards repentance. I don't know if you remember uh, the very first sermon that uh, Jesus preached. It is recorded uh, by the gospel writer Matthew. Matthew records his very first sermon, and Jesus uh, preached this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Too often, and for too many people, the call to repentance, to turn away from sin, 
is seen negatively. But the Bible teaches, and God offers it as, a, as an act of grace. He says, come to me. Lay that burden of sin down. Yes, you've made a wrong choice. Yes, you've made a choice that is not all that I intend for you. But when you turn to me, and when you offer up that wrong choice to me, I will hear you. And I will receive you. And I will forgive you and set you right. Because the fact is, sin entangles. And then sin ensnares, as if in a trap. And ultimately, always and only, sin leads to death. The very call of God to call you out of sin and to repentance is itself an act of grace. That's what I want you to, to understand uh, this morning. The grace of repentance. Sometimes people uh, come to me pastorally and they say, uh, what if God doesn't answer my call? What if he, what if he uh, doesn't incline his ear to me? And they are worried and they're anxious about that and they want me to pray with them and for them. I always smile inwardly when this happens because the fact that they are worried and the fact that they are anxious, the fact that their hearts are troubled for having offended God is already a sign that God is there, working in their hearts, calling them out of sin and to himself. So here's the thing. The longer we don't talk about sin, the closer we are to death. I urge you instead to learn from David and to return, like he did, to worship God. David sinned, yes, he did. But it was then that the grace of God met him in that deep, dark, fallen place. Hear this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So acknowledge your sin Acknowledge him, and you can sing along with David. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen? Let us pray. Father in heaven, why is it that, that we shy away from the tough conversations? Because it is only by having the tough conversations, by acknowledging our failures and our fallings and our sin, that we can appear before you with open hands and open hearts to receive your grace. Father, I thank you for hearts that are repentant. I thank you when uh, something stirs inside of us when we are anxious to receive your grace, when we are bothered about our sin and our shortcomings. Because I know that, Father, when we are bothered like this, <laughs> it is a sign that you are already at work in us calling us back to yourself. Father, I acknowledge my sin. Forgive me when I don't measure up, Father, to the good that you intend for me. Forgive me, Father, when I hide my face from yours. 
stir me instead, Father, to walk towards you. Because it is in walking towards you that I walk away from sin. Help me, Father, to keep you enthroned in the heart, in my heart, and in my life. Receive me with all my failings and with all my sin. I am yours. Love me and show me your grace. Turn me from sinner to saint. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I hope that you've seen uh, in our service today um, the grace and the great love of God that can lift us all up out of our sin. As you walk into uh, your week uh, this week, I hope uh, that you will lay your burdens down, the burden of sin, if there's something in your life that uh, you need to deal with, I hope that uh, today's message has encouraged you to, uh, to be able to do that, to approach God. Because when you do, uh, he will receive you in open arms. When you give uh, your bad choices uh, to God, uh, and when you put him back on the throne of your heart, uh, he will be there and he will lift you up. And you will live in his grace and with power. Receive now his grace and his power as you enter into your week. week. The grace of God, shown to us in the love of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. These things go with you, lifting you out of the dark and into his wonderful light. Go with God. Amen. <laughs>